The next talk is given by Yvonne Stahl, also from Düsseldorf, as you have already heard. Um, Yvonne also studied biology in Cologne, then moved to Edinburgh in Scotland, where she got her PhD in 2003 in the group of Peter Morris. Um, and afterwards, um, she moved back to Germany, then to Düsseldorf, um, where she started her own group, focusing on plant root biology and obviously using a lot of um, fluorescent techniques such as spectroscopy and also FRET. Um, things. And um, the title of her talk is Application of Faster Resonance Energy Transfer in Plant Biology. And maybe before you start, Yvonne, let me um, explain one thing to those not coming from, um, from Germany. Förster is a family name of a guy who discovered this thing. So don't wonder what this is, maybe some kind of strange um, abbreviation. It's also a profession, um, but it has nothing to do with that. Um, it's just the family name of the guy who first described it. Okay, and with that, Yvonne, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> and I hope you can also see my screen. So I'm trying to put on the presenter mode now. Hopefully it works. There we go. So um, thanks for the nice introduction first. And thankfully, Steffi has already given a very nice um, explanatory talk about the techniques um, and I'm going to give you the opportunity now to look at um, how we can apply this method FRET in plant biology. So I'm trying to lure you onto the green side of life. So here as you can see this little tree plants have this very fascinating capacity of surviving in very adverse conditions. You see this tree literally clinging onto this cliff here in Bryce Canyon in Utah. And for this, plants have to have a lot of plasticity in their development. And for this plasticity, they need uh, stem cells. So they need stem cells for their post-embryonic development, but also their development throughout life. If one compares the development of, for example, humans here, to the ones of plants. You see, we start with the same, with the fertilized egg here, and then embryogenesis takes place. But when um, the human here is born, you see that it's almost ready, and until adulthood, almost only growth takes place. And if you compare this now to a seedling here, a plant, you see what you first see is that you see only one or two cotyledons and a primary root. And you cannot even say what kind of plant it will be when it's an adult plant. So for plants, a lot of the developmental processes take place after germination. And for this, the plants need stem cells. During their whole life, the plants need these stem cells to produce all organs, like uh, leaves, flowers, and so on. And a plant life can be very long. As you can see here, uh, this sequoia tree is more than 2,000 years old, and it still produces a lot of organs all the time that it needs. Whereas we humans, we cannot come, come to this kind of age here. So plants are really good at maintaining their stem cells. Now the stem cells in the plant are residing in structures called meristems. And the meristems are at the either tip of the plant. Here at the top, in between the cotyledons of this Arbidopsis thaliana seedling, which is our model plant you see the shoot apical meristem, which gives rise to all the above ground organs of the plant, all the leaves, um, the shoot, the flowers, and the fruit here, the silix. Whereas the root apical meristem here at the tip of the primary root gives rise to the whole um, root system of the plant below ground. Depicted here, you can see schematic views of shoot and root apical meristems, where you can see the stem cells in blue and organizing cells here in red. 
And these errors indicate a lot of um, signaling that has to take place to maintain the right amount of stem cells. Not too many, not, uh, not uh, too few of them. So stem cell homeostasis is key here. And I will focus later on more on the root apical chimera stem. Here we also have in blue the stem cells. Here it's a bit different. The stem cells are surrounding the organizing cells of the quiescent center here in red, but also here homeostasis has to take place. And the red cells here, the quiescent center cells organize the stem cells. Now the whole research that we're doing is uh, about the power of balance. When a stem cell here divides, a decision has to be cast if it maintains stem cell character or becomes a differentiated cell. And within the last 20 or so years, it became clear that not only the um, uh, like auxin or phy other phytohormones in the plant kingdom are very important for maintaining the shoot apical meristem here, depicted here again. But also small peptides like this one in blue here, Clavata 3, which is expressed from the stem cells in the shoot apical meristem, gets perceived by mucin rich repeat receptor like kinases, which then repress a homeodomain transcription factor called Wuschel which is expressed here in the organizing center just below the stem cells. And this homeodomain transcription factor has a positive effect on stem cell fate. And this leads to a positive feedback loop here. Now, some time ago, we could also show that there's a similar but also slightly different uh, way how the root apical stem is maintained also with um, a small peptide, which is the Clavada 3 homolog, CLE40, also with receptor like kinases, which are present here in the root apical meristem, and which regulate a homeodomain transcription factor called VOX5, which is expressed in the quiescent center. Now, we do a lot of the observations of which players are now necessary for this uh, stem cell homeostasis in the root or in the shoot by using fluorescently labeled proteins or receptors, for example. And these receptors are transmembrane spanning receptors like such. And we label them with different fluorescent proteins, GFP and CHERRY, for example. And we can do this either in um, Arabidopsis thaliana itself, we can transform Arabidopsis. But quicker, faster is a transient expression system, which gives us also the chance to try where to put the label, where to put the GFP and cherry and so on, N-terminal or C-terminal, or sometimes in the middle of the protein if necessary, and look if it localizes right still. So for this, we use these little plants here, Nicotiana ventamiana, so tobacco, and infiltrate agrobacteria carrying the plasmids that encode for these proteins and infiltrate them into the lower side of the epidermis here. And then we look at the expression level, for example. And expression levels are very important because one thing you want to avoid is overexpression. So this is an example of one of these uh, receptor-like kinases, Clavata 1, which is important in the shoot, also in the root apical meristem maintenance. And 35S is a, cons a constitutive promoter. And if we use this in our transient system, the Nicotiana ventamiana, you see that after a couple of days, you see expression, you see GFP, but you see it in these kind of structures here, almost like Christmas goggles. And this is not the localization which is normal because we know that Clavada 1 is a transmembrane protein that should localize to the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane would be, of course, at the edge of these puzzle shaped epidermal cells of Nicotiana bentamiana leaves. We can see this normal localization if we use inducible promoters for this transient system. And this is an example of what we mostly use as a transient, uh, in our transient system, an inducible promoter that 
consists of um, an XDE system with the regulatory region of the human estrogen receptor. And of course, plants don't have this. So we can use it in plants. Um, so this XDE is produced. And only if we apply now estradiol and estrogen towards the plants, then this will actually then um, lead to the binding to this minimal promoter so that our gene of interest, for example, labeled with the GFP is expressed. And then after a specific time, we can look and um, estimate if the expression is at a normal level or if it's overexpressed and therefore time the experiments very well. Now, Steffi very nicely has explained already FRED, so I don't have to go into too much detail. Um, the experiments I'm going to show later are all proteins of interest, which are uh, labeled with either GFP as a donor and, and Cherry as an acceptor. And if the two are too far from each other, we won't see FRET. We only see FRET if they come close enough. And for GFP and M Cherry, the first star radius or this distance here is below five nanometer even. And as you've already heard, this affects, FRET affects the fluorescence intensity in that the donor fluorescence goes down, the acceptor fluorescence goes up and also the fluorescence lifetime where the donor fluorescence uh, decreases, which is dependent on the spectral overlap of the FRET pair and the distance and the orientation of these dipole moments here. Now, how can we measure FRET in vivo? Uh, we can do this, and that's what we usually do in this, uh, yeah, first we measure um, accept of photo bleaching because it's quick and fast and you can you have a high throughput and later if we are happy with um, which uh, where we put the label where we put the GFP N or C terminus uh, which protein of interest is the acceptor or um, the donor then we go to the more advanced presence lifetime imaging just to give you an example of FRET acceptor photo bleaching here, these are two um, transcription factors. One is AS1 labeled with the EGFP. This is uh, the donor sample and co-expressed with the AS2 transcription factor labeled with MCherry. And when I start this movie now, you we bleach away in this part here, the acceptor, and please look at this part now. And hopefully you've seen that after the bleaching of the acceptor, that uh, the donor intensity was higher, so more red. And if we look at this again here, over time, the intensity, you can see here for the donor intensity that after the bleaching of the acceptor, you see a rise in intensity of the donor. And this is a very good indication that FRET has taken place beforehand. And you can quantify this very nicely and easily by uh, just looking at the intensities of the donor and of uh, after and before the bleach of the acceptor. And then you get an apparent FRET um, that you can measure here. So when we're happy with this, then we think, okay, which samples uh, are the most promising? We want to look at them closer, also in a better resolution because for FRET acceptor photo bleaching, you image uh, very fast, but, uh, and then you, you might lose some details. So then we go with these samples um, and measure flim FRET. And you've learned that for this, of course, you need some instrumentation, certain pulse lasers and TCSPC electronics. And uh, to build up here your time correlated photon counting histograms and to be able to measure the fluorescence lifetime of your donor. 
So to come back to, to biology a little bit. So we've been wondering if these two receptors here, Clavata 1 and ACR4, which we know are expressed in the root, in the meristem here where the stem cells reside, are also interacting. And for this, we first looked at um, transiently here in Nicotiana bentamiana and expressed ACR4 labeled with GFP here and Clavata 1 again and saw that they are localized to the plasma membrane. This is a plasma membrane dye. And we also saw these foci here, these very bright bits, which are co-staining with anilin blue, which stains callos. And this is an indication for um, plasmodesmata localization. And we can also see this localization in Arabidopsis, in stable Arabidopsis lines here. Now the question of course is if Clavada 1 and ACR4 can interact with each other. And for this, we measured Fred Flim. And we used in this case ACR4 labeled with GFP as a donor, and we could measure a certain lifetime of 2.4 nanoseconds. If we co-expressed Clavada 1, uh, labeled with an M cherry here as the acceptor, we see a drop in the fluorescence lifetime, so a good indicator for interaction. And uh, we can disturb this interaction if we exchange the transmembrane domain to the one of another receptor and go back to donor only lifetimes. But we also saw that um, ACR4 and Clavata 1 can form homomers. So how to distinguish heteromeric and homomeric complexes. And this is where fluorescence anisotropy um, comes to help. And Steffi very nicely explained that we have a GFP labeled protein of interest here. This is the GFP with the dipole moment here. If we have another one of those, the same one, very close by, homophred can take place. And if you excite this polarized light, which is your laser source, then you get um, emission of your GFP in a certain direction in this case. And if you have homofred, you change this and get an R value, which is smaller than before. So what you have to remember is the higher or the bigger the complexes are, the lower the anisotropy. But if you have heterofret taking place here, like a one-on-one -on -one situation, you have a higher anisotropy than before. So you can also have mixed forms. If you would plot this now in one of these multi-parameter 2D plots, so lifetime versus anisotropy here, and we look at our control, which is always the donor only sample here, like ACR4 GFP, we have a certain lifetime and a certain anisotropy. Um, if we co express now Clavada 1 uh, and Cherry as an acceptor, we see a lower fluorescence lifetime and a higher anisotropy if it's a one on one situation here. If you have homofred going on, we have the same fluorescence lifetime, but a lower anisotropy. And of course, you can have both situations at the same time. You can have hetero and homofred. And here's the example that Steffi already talked about a, a little in her talk. Um, so this is the real sample now. This is ACR4 GFP at the plasma membrane and the bright dots are plasmodesmata. This is our donor only sample. If you look at the fluorescence lifetime here color coded, this is quite homogeneously distributed. If you look at the anisotropy values, you see that we have darker bluish uh, colors where the plasmodesmata are. So this is a good indication for homofred. So looking at, if we plot again here, this 2D plot, looking at pixel only coming from the plasma membrane, we see this kind of island here. 
if we look at pixel coming from the plasmodesmata, you see we have the same fluorescence lifetime, but a lower anisotropy. So at the plasmodesmata, we think we have bigger complexes of ACR4. Now, if we co-express Clavada 1 and Cherry, it looks like this. So you see that the fluorescence lifetime is in general more green, so a lower fluorescence lifetime, especially here at the plasmodesmata, we see even blue colors. And this you can also see in the diagram here, we see in general a lower fluorescence lifetime and a higher anisotropy at the plasma membrane. This is pixel only from the plasma membrane. And if we look at pixel coming only from the plasmodesmata, we see that here also a drop in fluorescence anisotropy and lifetime is taking place. So we think that at the plasmodesmata, we have this situation, we have homomers and heteromers at the same time. And this led us to propose this kind of model. Plasmodesmata are like gap junctions in animal cells, so they connect the cells with each other. So we think that there's a stemless factor moving through plasmodesmata along these different kind of um, receptor complexes that these stemless factor gets modified and then at some point cannot move any further. And then at this part here, differentiation takes place. We were asking what is such a factor, what could be such a factor, and we had some candidates. One is the Wuschel homolog Vox5 itself, which is expressed in the Quaison center here. And here the protein fusion, you can see that it can also move. Or transcription factors of the plethora group, which are expressed very nicely here in the root meristem, which were good candidates. And we looked first again in the transient system, expressing one of these plethora here and the box five labeled with GFP and M cherry. And this is one nucleus here. And you see that plethora three has a very uh, interesting localization within the nucleus. It forms nuclear bodies. Uh, box five doesn't do it, but if you co express plethora three with box five, box five gets recruited to the same nuclear bodies here. And of course, the, the question was if they can really interact. We know that the expression domains in the root are overlapping. And we see that uh, within the transient system, they localize to the nucleus and one gets even translocated to these nuclear bodies. We measured uh, FLIM, Fred FLIM, of course. Here, plethora 3 GFP as a donor only sample has a specific lifetime of around 2.5 nanoseconds. Plethora 3 can very nicely interact with itself. As you can see here, it, the lifetime drops significantly. It also significantly drops if you co-express Vox5 and Cherry as an acceptor. And there's no such drop if you express um, an histone 2A labeled with acceptor and Cherry. And again, how to distinguish hetero and homomeric complexes. Um, we've done the multiparameter fluorescence image spectroscopy again. This is the intensity image of a nucleus uh, expressing plethora 3 GFP. This is the corresponding lifetime image. For every pixel, you see the lifetime, very homogeneous. The anisotropy is far from homogeneous. You see where the um, high intensities are, the nuclear bodies, you see a low anisotropy. And we can plot this. Um, the uh, pixel coming from the nucleoplasm are in orange and the smaller population is always the one from the, uh, from the nuclear bodies only. And you see that they have a lower anisotropy, so homomeric complex formation. We can also do uh, a heterofret experiment. We co-express plethora 3 GFP and plethora 3 M cherry at the same time. And we see also a fluorescence lifetime change. So interaction, of course, homomeric formation. Again, the blue population is the one only from the uh, nuclear bodies. 
Now, this is uh, the interesting sample, the threat sample. Does plethora three and box five interact? Yes, you can see you have a lower residence lifetime. The orange dotted line is the one from our donor only sample, our control. And this is uh, the uh, negative control code specimen histone 2A, and you don't see this residence lifetime change. Now, without going into too much more detail here, um, we think that there are also external cues that are integrated also into this uh, peculiar subnuclear localization that also um, have something to say about the decision if a cell remains stem cell character or differentiates. We've also been able, and this is in a cooperation with um, a colleague, um, from Saudi Arabia, Ikram Lilo, that we can measure FRET FLIM also in Arabidopsis roots, so in stable Arabidopsis lines using endogenous promoters here of two different transcription factors. And uh, you see here in the donor channel, in YFP channel, you see that here we have Jector YFP in two cell layers, and the acceptor is only expressed in in this cell layer here, in the endodermal cell layer, in the inner one. And this is something that you can really nicely see now. This is a donor-only sample. You have these two cell layers here, and they have more or less the same color, so the same lifetime, this is a heat map. But if we co-express now Scarecrow um, RFP with the acceptor, you see that we get a lower fluorescence lifetime here in the inner layer of the root where exactly the scarecrow RFP is expressed. Okay, and I hope um, that I could show you now how you can apply these different techniques and how you can actually use this to extend the kind of resolution that you can get uh, from normal confocal microscopy by using, for example, thread flim, because there we have distances below 10 nanometers that are really difficult otherwise to get to. And with this, I'm closing my talk, not without thanking my group uh, and also Steffi for cooperation. And thank you for the invitation for the talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Yvonne, for your talk and the uh, nice images. Um, from the chat so far, I don't see much. Um, that gives me the chance to ask a question myself. So in, uh, in, in these, uh, these uh, two different cell layers that you have described, uh, yeah. in, in the, um, that one, right. So, um, what's the what's then the, uh, the the consequence for biology that you take out of it? So, yes, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mention. So these these are very um, important transcription factors for asymmetric cell division. Mm -hmm. And nice. uh, here, just next to the QC, the cortex endodermis initial divides asymmetrically to give rise to two different cell layers. Mm -hmm. And this is the question they had. If, if you can see differences in these different cells, so cortex endodermis initial is this one here, which has um, uh, slightly less lifetime reductions in comparison to the ones of the endodermis, so the differentiated ones. Yeah, so this was to, to answer the question, can we see this also into, in the interaction of these transcription factors? Okay. And um, in, in general, it seems that um, plant fluorescent proteins are either in tobacco or in Arabidopsis. Is that right? So that... Yes, well, Arabidopsis is our model organisms, but you can also use um, fluorescently labeled um, proteins in other um, plants, like for example in barley, we've done this also, or in Bacantia. There's a lot of different plants that you can use. Arabidopsis is the model because it's very easy to transform and it doesn't have a very long lifetime. Yeah, so lifetime in the mean of only yeah. six to eight weeks 
for <laughs> setting seeds for the next generation and not like years on years. <laughs> not quite the same time scale as for us in lifetime. Um, not okay, now, now we do have some questions here. Um, um, there is a question from Liat. Um, sorry if I missed this at the start, but do you find the reduction of the donor only fluorescent lifetime compared to the reported lifetime when it's localized in a crowded cell compartment? Ah, yes, you do, you do get this. And this is something, well, usually the, the thing is flim or FRET flim measurements are not, um, yeah, so that the intensity doesn't take such a prominent place there. But if you have very, very strongly expressing compartments, we have to um, consider, depending on the system, you're using a pileup effect. So you can have technical issues there that you have an artificially reduced uh, fluorescence lifetime. So mm -hmm. depending on the system you're using, you have to take this into consideration. But um, we will probably talk about this during our workshop. And there is another question from Chloe. In your collaboration with Long et al, what is the advantage of using YFP as donor fluorochrome instead of a monomeric GFP? If any. Um, the, <laughs> if any, yes. You know, this is um, a, a long going cooperation we had. And until the publication was out, I think um, we, we, we've been measuring several years. At that time, um, when they produced the lines, uh, so the double labeled lines and had them homozygous and so on, um, this was what they had. So we used them. So there's not a real advantage in, in using YFP, which bleaches a bit too much to my liking. I would rather use other uh, fluorescent proteins, but this is what we had yeah, at the time. Fair enough. Um, there is one more. Is it always better to, a question from Adriana, is it always better to use inducible promoters? In our system, we don't see overexpression artifacts, but maybe we overlook them. If, if you are certain that there's no overexpression artifact for you, that's fine. I mean, what we also do is we try to complement uh, mutant lines if possible using endogenous promoters, or if these are too weak, you can also have the other problem. You can have too weak an expression to be able to measure uh, Fred Flim, for example. You have to have some codons to measure. But this depends on your system. It's, it's good to have a, a good control, let's say, that you're sure that the localization is still the same, that you can rescue your mutants, whatever your system is, and then you're, you're good to go. For us, uh, it makes a big difference especially with these receptors, they tend to form aggregates if they are too highly expressed. Okay, and we have as of now a last question from Hella. Does autofluorescence of the plant cell wall impact the experiment? Oh yes, uh, yeah, autofluorescence is a big issue in plants, obviously, and um, Yes, uh, the cell wall has a lot of autofluorescence, also other compartments of the plant. The root is usually better than green tissues. Chlorophyll, of course, is also an issue. But um, yeah, you have to check this beforehand. And in the very first uh, sets of data that we were acquiring using FLIM, we used also blue fluorescent protein, CFP, for example, and we just had to stop that because there was too much autofluorescence from the cell wall in this range. So you have to find your niche, yeah, where the fluorescence is okay. So um, thank you very much, Yvonne, for the nice talk and for all the answers on all the questions. We actually um, got them all at this point, I think. Great. And um, uh, so thank you again. Um, and um, this starts then the next topic, which happens to be the, how did we call it, virtual coffee break, I think.